Well, amen. Hallelujah. Let us stand on our feet for a moment. I'll tell you right now, Clinton Nutterbach is an exciting man. Praise God. I love to hear him sing. I just love him. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the word. We give you praise and thanksgiving for the word of the living God. For it is sharp and any two-edged sword. And we invite, dear Father, we invite that cutting edge of that sword into this place today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. For we know when it's placed in the hands of the living God that it will be used in love. And we thank you for it. For we preach it. We place the word. We place ourselves, spirit, soul, and body into the hands of the spirit of the living God. Expecting the very best. Expecting the results. Expecting every single thing called to us by the word of God. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Shake hands with someone. Say thank God for the word. And you can be seated. First of all, I want to say how thrilled and glorious I was to be at camp meeting. I'll tell you, it's gotten for the last few years, we judge everything by camp meeting. You know, every, that happened just before camp meeting last year. That happened right after camp meeting last year. It seemed like you just go from camp meeting to camp meeting and everything else is just kind of in between. Praise the Lord. I thank God for it. I appreciate it. The ministry, the, the Hagen ministry from the from its top to its bottom and everything about this ministry, I'm thrilled with it and I thank God for it and I'm more than pleased to be a part of this camp meeting and this convention. Praise the Lord. Let's open our Bibles today to Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're going to read a couple of scriptures here and then we're going to go over to uh, the New Testament in 1 John, so you might go ahead and look up both openings. Let's start reading from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land where thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce you unto you this day. I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish, and that you shall not prolong your days upon the earth, whether thou goest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice. That thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life. Read that phrase aloud. For he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Now you notice it said, He is thy life. Choose Him, for He is thy life and the length of thy days. But did you notice who does the choosing? We have, in particular in the body of Christ, it is more true to the body of Christ even than it was to Israel. Because Jesus is the author of our life. He is life. He said, I have come that they have life and have it more abundantly. So this is even more true to the born again child of God than it was to, to Israel. 
As they received this life based on a promise, we receive this life based on a fact. And it's not just prolonged human life because we are not living on human life. I don't know whether you realize that or not. The born again child of God's not living on human life. We're living on the life of God. The Apostle Paul said, The life that I live, I live by the faith of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He said, I was crucified with Christ, yet nevertheless I live, not me, not me, Christ within me, the hope of glory. We have supernatural life residing on the inside of us. But we have some choices to make. Now let's back up in there and, and notice a couple of things here. Notice he said, well that's just that's redemptive, line by line. Don't read it like... A lot of people read your Bible. You read your Bible like not any of it ever going to happen to you anyway. Just whole home, you know. You pick up a newspaper, read it, and say, Oh my God, did you read what we read yesterday? Because you build all that you read, and that huge thing is going to happen for you. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't believe you realize not that everything in this book is happening and is going to happen to you. One way or the other. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Now, it doesn't say here that God put the evil here. Now, you can kind of twist that out of it, I guess. But this explains that. I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. And that I commanded thee this day to love the Lord thy God. In other words, I have commanded you to love God. So that's the good. But you have a choice. And anything else is going to be the evil. So God didn't say, I put the evil up there to you. No, he just said, in that I have commanded you to love the Lord thy God. If it wasn't for God, nobody would have a choice. Because Adam legally ceased our choice off in the Garden of Eden. He got rid of our choice. And God had to come back through covenant means and rebuild and reestablish Abraham and his, and his seed the choice that they could use and act on their will. Otherwise, Satan would be the only choice. And thank God Jesus is Lord. Thank God he's Lord. Well, I'm glad it's not somebody else. I never met anybody else that, I'm, that I wanted to be Lord. Everybody I have ever met, you know, was frowning at that. Said, like, where did you come here? But thank God we have a choice. Praise the Lord. So God is saying, if you keep my commandments and statutes and judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, the Lord thy God shall bless thee. It didn't say there's a good, there's a good chance he might. And if you, if you will uh, keep his commandments, that, uh, you know, he would bless you. Uh, unless he decides to teach you something, and then he's going to make you sick. Didn't mention that. Sick, now that's, that's on the good side. That's on the dead side, the death side. He said, if you will keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Now we are, according to the book of Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, particularly those two verses. Well, hold your finger right there, Deuteronomy. Let's turn over there and read that in Prophets, because I want this to mark your, your thinking so indelibly that it changes the way you read both the Old Covenant and the New from now on. Most of you know this, but I'm going to reiterate it for those that maybe have not captured this in your thinking yet. You're not going to get in the kingdom of God when your body dies and you go to heaven. If you're not in the kingdom of God before your body dies and you, you, you're not going to heaven. You're in the kingdom of God now. You sit up there and sing, you know, I'm just where there's not my home, I'm just passing through. When are you going to start acting like that? 
I'm telling you, this, this, this earth is fortunate that we're here. Because brother, when we leave here, this is going to rot in less than 10 years. Less than 10 years time till the big bang jar. When we get out of here. We're here for that reason. That's the reason you didn't just leave here when you got born again. That's the reason your body didn't just get reconstructed and you just be typed out of here the moment you got born again. You had to leave the right to it. The moment you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you became a citizen of the kingdom of glory. And you had a legal right that moment just to leave here. Just, just ship out, boy. Just be gone. And in our natural thinking, we think sometimes, dear Lord, you know, isn't it have been better if I had? No, we have a job to do here. God does not desire to turn this planet over. He does not desire to turn the human race over to the merciless and the unmerciless warped mind of Satan until his household is full, until his job has been completed. But our citizenship is not in this earth. We are not even required and we are not even bound by the natural laws that bind this earth. We're not bound by natural law. We should not violate natural law, the part of the natural laws that have been set in motion by God, such as violating the natural laws that govern your body. You ought not be violating the laws that govern your body. You shouldn't be doing things with, to your body to destroy it. That's against God. But right on the other hand, there are many, many natural laws on this planet that have been operating in a warped fashion since the day that Adam fell in the Garden of Eden. The heat waves that we've been experiencing now for days and days and days, that, that's not the way God set this planet up. And we're not bound to that. That thing has been one of the most difficult ones to, to pray about I've experienced. There's some things in it that I hadn't heard of before. And uh, I, I didn't really know just exactly how to go at it every time I started praying about it. Just, I, I just run into a dead end street now. I never, never had experienced that praying where weather was concerned before. before. Really, weather actually, when you learn the laws of God, in reality, is one of the easiest things to hand spirit to hand to hand. Because it's really not a matter of prayer, it's a matter of exercising judgment over it and taking authority over it in the name of Jesus, and then the angels go into operation and carry out that judgment. But I ran into a few of them, and I really had to go back to some of the things that I had already learned as, a, as an aviator, as a pilot, I had to go back to some basic weather principles really to find out what to do. And every time I'd start in at some other direction, I'd, I'd, I'd run into difficulties. Well, and I, and I realized that it was going to take a massive low-pressure system to move this massive hive that's been causing all this. And I recognized I've always prayed to stop a storm, not start one. <laughs> you know, I never, I never used my faith before to start a hurricane. And it takes that kind of massive low depression in the Gulf to stop this. And then I went to the Lord one day. I said, Lord, I said, what, what is this? What's so different about this? He said, well, you've got to move into that area, into an area that's, that has to do with the signs of the end times. He said, it's a difficult time. I said, uh, is it, can we not change those things that are signs? He said, no, I didn't say you couldn't change them. But your very changing of them will be another sign. Simply a sign any way you go at it. See? So really I have to do some kind of backing up and reverse thinking there. Because not only are you responsible, are we responsible for starting that low pressure system down there in the Gulf. But then we're going to have to be, be on guard and be ready to stop that thing before it gets shorter in the form of a hurricane. You're getting a little taste of what God's been putting up with for 8,000 years. <laughs> Ever since this thing got in this kind of a mess. 
Well, praise the Lord. Some of you sitting there looking at me like a dog with a new pan. You don't order to eat out of that or not. Well, that's all right. You better carry your raincoat with you, I guarantee you. Well, let's pray up the Lord. In Colossians chapter 1, look at the 12th and 13th verses. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet, or able, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. I want you to underline those two words of that phrase, in light. It's going to become important later on as we study. Who has, once again past tense, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, or the authority of darkness, and has, past tense once again, not future, has already, and the people he was writing this letter to were still uh, physically alive and in the earth, has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood. So now we are already in the kingdom of God. I was watching a church service on television, and uh, somebody was reading the Apostles' Creed. Now, I don't know what apostle that creed was, but it was one that didn't know too much about the New Testament. The only time the apostle said, I know, I know, I know, I know, dear Lord. I'm not jumping on your denomination. I'm jumping on the unbelief in your denomination. And on the unbelief in all of our denominations. And everybody else that's read through the Bible and just made blatant mistakes about it because we didn't read it properly. In the Apostles' Creed, you know, you come down the line and says, we believe in this, we believe in that, we believe in this, we believe in that, we believe in this. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And he is not the only begotten Son of God. If he's the only begotten Son of God, then Calvary was a race. Because the Bible said he came to be the firstborn of many brethren. And there is a well-known, well-versed, powerful phrase in the New Testament called being born again. And the second time I was born on the second day of November in 1962, I was not born a sinner again. I was not born a citizen again of this planet. I was not born again as an heir of heaven. I was not born again as an heir of sin. I was not born again into this life. I was born of the Spirit of the living God, a child of Almighty God, and a joint heir with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Now then, with that information and that knowledge that I have I command that we are in the kingdom of God now. You are in the Spirit. The Bible says very plainly, we are in the Spirit. Christian people, particularly pro-gospel people, have been laboring on the idea that Christ tried to get in the Spirit. It's one of our own things that caused us to think that way. But where, where we've been in error in that kind of thinking is this. If I could just ever get my body under subjection, then I'd walk in the Spirit. If you don't walk in the Spirit, you never want to get your body under subjection. See, the Word said, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then the book of Romans will simply say, we are in the Spirit. You've been born into it. Now you can walk... To walk in or walk out of, of the sin and so forth, the way that in the text, the context that the Bible uses it, is simply talking about the daily conduct. To walk in the Spirit is another thing. Walking in the Spirit is to conduct your affairs according to the laws of the Spirit rather than the laws of the natural. See? To walk in the natural doesn't mean that you're in the natural. It means you're conducting yourself as if you were in the natural. And if you do that, you're going to live by those laws. And I'll tell you what, they'll kill you. I mean, they're designed to kill you. This whole system's designed to kill you. 
God system is not heaven system designed for success and it designs many, praise God. All right, let's go back then to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and read some more. Let's go into that 17th verse. No, let's back up and read that again in this 16th verse, the last half of that. That thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. You mean to tell me we have to possess the kingdom of God in this life? Well, if you try to walk in it any length of time, you know good and well you don't have to. Everything you need from God, everything you need from the Word of God, everything you need through prayer, everything you need by faith, everything you need walking in the Spirit, you are going to have to lay a hold of the hope in it. You're going to have to lay a hold of the faith in it. You're going to have to lay a hold of confession in it, or you're not going to get it. It has to be possessed. Why is that? Because the whole thing is built on the faith plant hearted principle. Those are the laws that govern it. You plant the seed and you get the harvest. You have the will, therefore, to make choice. You have a choice to not plant at all. You have a choice to plant one or the other. You have a choice not to harvest and to plant. You have a choice to succeed or to fail. You have to make some firm decisions in this or you die. You're just not going to make it. That's all there is to it. You're going to make it or not die. There's no such thing as a zero in life. You're either going one way or the other. You cannot stand still. There's no way. You're a spiritual being and spirits can't remain static. You're either growing or shrinking. You're either moving forward or backward. You're never static, particularly in the things of God, but you're not even static in the things of this, this natural life. You're getting older, darling, <laughs> in the natural. Every day that goes by, you can't help it. Isn't that right? You better grow with it. Or you'll never get out of it alive. <laughs> now you might think, well, I don't know that that's the truth. Okay. Verse 17. If thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear. Notice what happens when your heart turns where you won't hear. Hear what? You won't hear the word of God. You won't hear the commandments, the judgments, and the statutes. If we won't listen. You remember what the book of Proverbs, the fourth chapter states to us in the 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th verses? To incline our ear unto the word of God. You can sit in one meeting right after another, go to church every day of your life, and never get a thing more of God saying unless you make a decision to incline your ear to what he's saying. I have been, I have come across that phrase to incline my ear to the word. And I, I was questioning God. I said, I, I, I think I know what you're talking about here, but I said, I would like to have you point out to me exactly what you're saying when you say this. A lot of times you can go to the dictionary, and most of the time you can go to the dictionary and get the definition of a word and tell pretty well what God's saying about it. But what God is saying about it, and what Mr. Webster is saying about it, is a whole lot different because God knows more about the word incline than Webster does. Amen. So there's a whole lot more to it, and I wanted to know what he was saying about it. And so I was led to get that. And it wasn't just a matter of days. I was talking to a man over the telephone. And a friend of mine said, I want you to talk to this fellow. I said, man, I mean, this is a powerful minister. It does, he, 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 God's calling is on him. He's won probably thousands of people to Jesus. His, his ministry is, is down. He's hurting. Something serious, I guess, has happened. He said, I don't know what it is, but he said, this man's a very close personal friend of mine. And he said, I can't get through to him with anything. He said, he's not himself. He said, every time you talk to him, man, I mean, said, he just, all he talks about is just hurting and dying and failing. And said, he can't make it and he can't hardly stand it. He said, I'm so close to him, it may be that I can't, you know, get through. He said, I, I wish you'd talk to him. So I said, well, all right. So 
Who she ran into as I talked to one night, and we were talking over the telephone. And when I got him on the telephone, I said, Well, praise the Lord, brother. I said, Isn't it good that Jesus is alive and well and at the right hand of the throne of majesty on high? And he said, Yeah, and ain't no more what we're going to do. He said, I never saw such a mess again in my life. <laughs> and any time I said something to him, he would... You know, it, it, conversation was difficult to hold with him because I wouldn't talk negative, he wouldn't talk positive. And uh, he's like chasing a chicken. He don't want nothing to do with her, you know. But every time I would say scripture, we'd become irritated. Well, that showed me right quick who was behind this, but I couldn't do anything about it because the man, the man would just, you know, he'd spar with me spiritually. He'd block me off everywhere I tried, but not the spirit behind the man would. And if I said anything from the word, I said, well, you know, brother, the Bible said by his stripes we were healed. Yeah, I know, bless God, but now let me tell you something. My wife is sick, my, you know, I'm sick, the kids are sick, the dog's sick, everybody's sick. And he'd get irritated and go to fussing with me, see, when I mentioned anything about scripture. I couldn't help it. Because well, not God couldn't help. Because see, the Bible, the scripture is the answer. That is the answer. God's already said that. Now, out of a thing like this is where you get strange things preached from pulpits. Because that man had put on a smile and his very best chapter talk. Well, he's pastor of a church, full gospel church. And he'd go up in front of that church and begin preaching some foolish thing that sounds good to him because his ear is not inclined to the word, it's inclined on this other stuff. So. Now, in that pulpit, he doesn't put on all that diet and carry on. He will make it sound convincing. It's convincing because he's convinced of it. And you get convinced to jump like that when you're, when you're not inclining your ear to the word. He will come up with something like, well, now by his stripes we were healed. He can't depend on that to get your body healed every time because that's spiritual. Well, certainly it's spiritual. That's the reason you can depend on it every time to get your body healed. If it was natural, you couldn't depend on it. But the fact that it is spiritual is the reason why you can depend on it, you see. Now see, his ear wasn't inclined to the word. He wouldn't hear. His heart was turned. That's a serious situation. He gets a heart turned. Because Satan has access to your very innermost cancer. With all of his negative junk, he can just tell you anything he wants to tell you and you will admit it and agree with it and just keep right on going. And every time God tries to turn it, every time God tries to say anything to you about it, you will step away and block it. Because your ear is not inclined to hear it. It makes you mad when anybody tries to help you. It makes you mad if anybody tries to quote the scripture to you. Particularly if it happens to be your wife. Or your husband. Or your mama. <laughs> you don't want to hear that. <laughs> Oh, Lord. <laughs> well, you get into a very serious situation. How can you break that? How can you stop it? There's not but one way to put a stop to that. The first thing that stops that is praise. Praise of God. You begin to praise God and your enemy will fall back at the presence of God. And in the midst of that praise, you can praise yourself right into victory. You can praise yourself right into, into a place where your ear will be inclined to the word. And when it, when it comes to that place, then you grab that word, brother, and you stick it in your ears, and you stick your ears in it. And don't let anything else in there. <laughs> then the next step is, thou shalt turn off the TV. <laughs> you're going to... You're going to have to turn off the world. you got your ears and your mind and your heart full of the world. You're going to have to quit being a friend of the world. It won't work. It won't mix that way. When you get to a point where you recognize that and you see that in yourself, 
You should be the first to judge yourself. In fact, it would be a very good idea to judge yourself of that thing and go immediately to the place to receive communion. Set it down at the table of the Lord and sit there in judgment over yourself and be honest with yourself and be ready to spiritually slap your own, your own spiritual jaws if necessary because that will keep you from having somebody else slap them. I'd rather really really be slapping myself than to be judged with the world. Amen? Amen. All right. <clears throat> Let's read the 17th verse again. If thine heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day. Did you notice the word used there? We have to kind of twist your mouth around and say it because it's not, it's not used very often like this. I denounce unto you. He didn't say, I announce unto you. I denounce unto you. That's strong, you know what I mean? I denounce unto you. This is not an announcement, it's a denouncement. I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish. Notice the word surely and underline it. That is a surety. You can do what you want to, but it's a surety. God is life and the wages of sin is death. Say it out loud. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. I want to talk to you for a moment or two about this. I remember when I was playing football, every once in a while, particularly about the time that the team thought we were really something. We had a winning ball club. I, I played on a winning team. And uh, we had gone a long ways, and we had broken every record that, that our high school had, and I mean, you know, we, we really had the idea that we were really something. And uh, about the time you get a little cocky and a little high-minded, a good coach will come in and tell you, okay, we're going to get back down to fundamentals. There's going to be some playing and blocking and tackling this week and somebody is going to sweat and somebody is going to hurt. Oh, I tell you, I hated to hear that. It's about the time you know you're feeling kind of pro <laughs> about all this. You know, well, why all we need is just a little pep talk, coach. Why we're going to beat everybody in the state, you know, and all that. That's the time he'd come down there and get you, I mean, just wing you until you felt surely, surely that's one of my eyeballs hanging out there on my jaw. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What is the reason for this? And then you, next week you bang into some old big boy, <laughs> you know, that just walk all over you. And you found out the reason for all this. Because he's in better shape than you are. Back to fundamentals. I don't want to talk about sin. I know it. You can stay on the fundamentals too long. You know, you can teach tackling until they can't anybody run. They tackle good, but they can't run with the ball. You can teach fielding until nobody in back. You can't win unless somebody gets hit once in a while. You listening to me? You have, you have to go on and progress and go on to deeper and greater things, but don't ever lose your grasp on the fundamentals. There's no such thing as being so high in faith and so strong in God that it's okay for you to sin. Sin will kill you. It'll kill you. It is death. That's the reason God's against it. That's the reason he's against it. He's not against you feeling good. He's not against you being high. He's just against you doing it on dirt. Why? Because it'll kill you. That's why. That's the reason he's against it. Adultery will kill you. That's the reason he's against it. That's the reason he's against murder. That's the reason he's against strife. That's the reason he's against anything. If anything he is against is death. He's life. And anything that is in opposition to him is death. He is ultimate life. He is life. In him there is no darkness at all. And anything that 
his heart is dead. I mean, his mind is dead. He's dead to God. He won't have it. Dead to you. That's the reason he's against it. All right. I'm going to say something to you right now. If you, if you listen to me, it'll, it'll stand you in good shape. There is an attack on in the body of Christ, especially where word people are concerned, in the area of their marriages. And you better wake up. It is a sin for two born again, spirit filled people to break up and divorce and all that junk in church. It's a sin. Something's going to have to be done about it. Now, there is a strong, strong spiritual move by the Spirit of God, particularly in the United States right now, to wake people up morally. To wake people up that homosexuality is a sin. It's not a form of government, dear God. To wake people up, when the Christian people finally wake up, you can turn this thing around the week's time. That, listen, don't sit there and gripe about what's on television. Don't sit there and just gripe about it. Write a simple letter and say, Dear Sir, I'm not going to brush my teeth with your stuff no more. In Jesus' name, amen. And it only takes, it only takes about a hundred of those, and when they go to getting millions of them, the name of their game is wonder where they ever will. They don't care what's on that television if you buy the stuff. And when the Christian people turn it around, it's going to be a different story. And you've got to remember, the Christians are the ones that are having the, the children and raising the families and brushing their teeth. Now some other people don't care about the teeth. But man, we're the ones drinking the orange juice and eating the oatmeal, man. Let them other people take their aspirins like the oatmeal people. And it'll change. And what's greater than that, and what's much more important than that, is you make a plan to vote this coming November, and you get yourself down there, and you vote. Did you hear me? And you pray about it before you go. And don't go in there and just jerk that Democratic lever or Republican lever just because that's all you've done for the last 35 years. Shame on you for that. Nobody, if a person is walking by the Word of God, nobody should be able to tell from your conduct or from your mouth whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or what you are. Because whoever is in office, you ought to be praying for them. You ought to be holding them up. You ought to be speaking good things about them regardless of what the news media says about them. I mean, that's just the way it is. I, uh, one thing that I'm going to tell you right now, where that, that particular issue is concerned, I don't lend this, I don't lend this ministry and this pulpit to politics. I don't, I don't lend it to one and, 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 and the other one. I keep this thing so there's, if ever I get the chance, I don't care what party they're in. I'm going to tell them what the Bible says. Now, now listen to this. And, and get this. And hold on to it. We are in control both in the spirit realm and the natural realm. We should be praying and interceding not only for the country but about whom we are to vote for. 
and how we are to conduct ourselves in these areas. I thought you were talking about sin. I am. In the eyes of God, who was instrumental in setting this form of government up for one reason and one reason only, and that's to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And for you and for me, not to carry out our responsibility in that is a blatant blas blasphemy. I mean, it's, it's blasphemous in the eyes of the commission of the church because he said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. And when we just fool around and spoof off our own responsibilities when it comes to our vote and comes to our control in this land, that's blasphemous to that commission because God set this country up for that reason. Are you listening to me? It is sin. Now on judgment day, don't you tell God you didn't know that. He'll say, that's what you think. I said, can't meet in that year too, you know. <laughs> yeah. Praise the Lord. All right. I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish... You shall not prolong your days on the land. Look at that phrase. Look at that phrase. You shall not prolong your days on the earth. You. You. It didn't say, I will not prolong your days on the earth. It said, you will not prolong your days on the earth. He said, you choose. Now we're talking about life. We're discussing life. The life of God. You choose it. Let me show you something about this. I'm going to use these two microphone stands here to illustrate this. And use them like they were halos. One's life and one's death. When the life goes up, the death goes down. When the life goes down, the death goes up. They don't just stay where they are. They are connected to one another because... Now listen to this and get hold of this now. I really missed that number. Somebody come pray over that, will you? When... The, <laughs> Life is the power force. Death follows it. You remove the life and the death will flood in. You bring the life in and death is pushed out. Death never overcomes life. You can't, it's God. same comparison is held between light and darkness. Darkness doesn't come in here and put out the lights. The only darkness there is is where there is no light. He folds his feet, even in this bright light here, he folds his feet in a certain way, there's a little darkness up in there in those, in those creases. There's a shadow here and there. The only reason that bit of darkness is there is because there's no light there. You move the light, the darkness moves. Wherever you move the light, that's where the darkness goes. The darkness follows it because if you move the light over here, the darkness went in over there. You turn the light back over here and the darkness is over here. Wherever there is no light, there is darkness. Wherever there is light, there is no darkness. Wherever there is life, there's no death. Wherever there is death, it's because life has not been removed, not because death overcame the life. Well, brother, I don't know. My, my, my somebody here there that loved God. I mean, my mother loved God. My daddy loved God. My, my husband, my wife loved God. And, and, uh, and I mean, they died young. And they went to church. And they did all these things. I don't care if they did. I can tell you right now what happened. Not enough room. Oh, brother, that couldn't be it. I mean, it's in the Bible night and day. I don't know anything about them. I know something about the Word. And Jesus said, my words are life. 
And don't ever judge it by being judged by the word. When that happens, it's because there is not enough word. The word is the life. And when you put the life in, the death has to go. See? So don't judge it by the person, judge it by the word. I know good and well wasn't enough word there. I don't know what they were doing, but I know something was a problem where life is concerned, or death could not have taken the place of the life. Well, we're going to get into that in a little deeper manner, and you'll see even some more about it as we go. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Against you. Verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. You know what he's saying? You don't have any excuse. But I mean, you don't have any excuse. When it's all said and done, you don't have a leg to stand on. He said, I'm calling heaven and earth to record this day. In other words, when you get the record and all that's in the earth, all the laws in the earth, all the function of the earth, all the principles in the earth are proof that God knows what he's talking about and he knows exactly what he's saying and he's given you and he's given me the choice. Well, somebody comes along and said, well, brother, now, uh, I don't, you know, that couldn't be right because I know somebody like that that died. That's none of your business. That's none of your business what somebody else did. The only business that you have is yours. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if everybody in the whole world died and I was the only one left, I'd still take God's word for it. I figure they're all wrong but him because he's still alive and they all dead. <laughs> because that'd just be the most sensible thing to do when they all died but him. I'd be inclined to take him with me, but now you know natural man's not inclined that way. Natural man is inclined to take the way all of them went. Particularly if it's going to call for any responsibility on his part. There's a whole lot of it is just religious cop-out and laziness and neglect and just plain old, just plain old shitlessness. There are a lot of, there are a lot of people that, that are, you know, nice people and all of that, but when it comes to spiritual things, just plain old, what they say out in West Texas, just sorry. Just don't do nothing. I'm talking about me, same as I have you. I know people work real hard and the natural won't do a flashing thing in the spiritual realm. Let their wife do it all. She'll outlive you too, Jack. You doing all the work and she's going to get all the baby. <laughs> That's right. She's going to outlive you. Well, that, you know, the, the, we're, we're rapidly changing that though because mama has quit staying at home and staying in the Word of God. She got off out there in that same mess she's out there in, so they're going to live about the same length of time. Now, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, but I have set before you lies and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both you and your seed may live. Now, This is something that, that, that's not really all that funny to talk about, but it's something that we have to talk about because, as I said earlier, we can't just stay static. We've got to continue to grow. And there are people who say, well, you know, this guy just goes great guns. I mean, you know, he just gets into ministry and he just gets blessed and great things are happening. Here's another guy over here, you know, he gets in the same ministry, does the same word, says the same thing, don't look like he ever gets anywhere. Well, there can be a lot of things behind that. But now here is one area that every single person should be responsible for, and not very many are. When you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, particularly when you caught that young lady by the hand, and you said... I do. Mm-hmm. I do, and I do for you. <laughs> you know? 
the Bible said you were separated from your mother and your father. And her father gave you away. That's the reason you ought to stay out of their affairs. You gave her away, now let her alone. That's hard to do, boy. <laughs> Not easy to do it all. Unless you have given her away to a man that's strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, like my oldest one. Dear Lord, I tell you, I don't have to fool with him. <laughs> you don't have to fool with him at all. There's a lot of times, spiritually, they wind up better off than I am. Where they're serving God. I mean, then, you know, 24 hours a day, just about all you can serve God. They work in this ministry. He's head of the art department. She's head of the TV department. Ain't that over at Old Roberts University? Just going on for God. But let me tell you something here. He said, choose life that you and your seed may live.
tương tư ông tầm ba mút xa tơ đêm nằm trộm nhớ mơ mơ về ai thì xa anh yêu rồi từ anh mắt nụ cười từ đôi môi gọi mơ xa xuống lòng anh thì xa mê em rồi Hey kid, don't ever let them get inside your head They'll tell you what to do in life instead Of everything you know that you could get Don't let them guide your life towards regret I'll fight for what I love with every breath My past is filled with things I won't forget I use them all to push me to my best So treat the worst of times just like a test if only I could go back in time I'd tell myself that everything will end up alright Just push yourself, test yourself, figure out what you like And find your limits, don't be rigid, always work towards a prime Surround yourself with open minds, people can change your life A few friends with intent can help you feel alive Find a passion, take some action, and with a little time Just be patient, make a statement, try to enjoy your life They'll try to kick you while you're down they wanna rise up while you drown They wanna fill your head with doubt They're silently scared that you'll figure it out I'll make it look like I'm losing Won't bother hiding my bruises And when they finally think you're wounded Then it's your chance to be ruthless I can see that they compare I think everyone's against me Maybe something in the air Am I paranoid? I swear a void is forming And they're scared I walk a street
Thank you.